Hi everyone. Today we're going to look at the rapture. This is something that uh, someone made a comment to me and I thought, you know what, I need to have a quick response and be, send a link out on this so that people don't get confused. Uh, so we're going to find out one of the clearest contradictions between Paul and Jesus is the rapture. The book of Revelation, the rapture actually takes place in Revelation 14. 14. It's not hard to see. The sickle comes down and grabs all the evil out and puts their bodies into a wine press of wrath and the blood is pouring everywhere. And the Paulinists have to say that's actually Christians. It's, it's such a contradiction between Paul and Jesus that they have to actually claim Gundry in his book called The Antichrist claims that's Christians. <laughs> so we'll see. But but you you need to know which is the truth. So here's Paul's truth. First Timothy 4, 16, 17. And tell me if you don't see this. Make sure you agree with me. This is Christians being raptured from earth because you're going to want to say this can't possibly be because Jesus contradicts it so clearly. Four, five, six times. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Not true. Not true at all. And just so you know, in the first 300 years of Christianity, that verse is never cited by anybody until 373, I think it is. We'll get to that site. So Christianity is going ahead and everyone's ignoring Paul. You know, he's he's a discard. We don't know that. We don't realize he was basically not that important. He was important to get rid of the Sabbath and Constantine cared about him then. But after that, you know, they just drop him like a little wet, wet potato. So prior to the 300s, none of the early church leaders ever repeated Paul's theory of a rapture of Christians. Paul's Christian rapture view never was mentioned as part of any end time anticipation by anyone between 100 and 373 AD, not once. The early church believed in what can be termed in today's terminology a non-Christian Christian rapture, meaning the evil are raptured, premillennialism. That means we're waiting for a millennial kingdom to begin that will begin by God, Jesus, rapturing out of the earth all the evil to allow the, the Christians to inherit the earth as it is. And God will renew it through the new heavens and the new earth. As Michael Vlock points out, the earliest Christians looked for three things, the return of Jesus Christ, a cataclysmic end to the present age, and a bodily resurrection from the dead, eschatology and church history. So you see, in this millennial kingdom, there's no rapture away from earth of Christians. We, why, we, why do we have to go up to come right back down? <laughs> because the kingdom is going to be here on earth, right? The New Jerusalem comes down to earth. So you, the picture you have in Revelation is not that we go up and then come down. We're down because this is where the kingdom's going to begin. And so anyway, Vlack says this, continues, the 1,000 year reign of Christ mentioned in Revelation 20 verses 1 to 6 was viewed eschatologically and futuristically, meaning here. <laughs> he points out the among the premillennialists in the early church were Papias, 60 AD to 130, Irenaeus, 130 to 200, Justin Martin from 100 to 165, and Tertullian, 160 to 225. However, in the late 300s, we have the first mention of 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17. And I showed you unquestionably, keep it in your mind, that was a rapture of Christians into heaven. Can't, we can't unsee that, right? It's in, etched in our brains. The writer was Ephraim, the Syrian. He is the only ancient source to cite Paul's passage to argue for such a rapture. His writing dates to 373 AD. Up to that time, no one formulated any end time view based on Paul's teaching that Christians will be raptured into heaven away from earth at the second coming of Christ. Now, Ephraim, the Syrian, makes it actually a valid comment on what it means. Okay, so he, and it was only recently translated. So this is probably why Christians don't realize how late this happens in church history. It is entitled, On the Last Times, the Antichrist and the Ends of the World. He states, quote, All the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation, which is to come, and are taken to the Lord in order that they may not see any time the confusion which overwhelms the world because of our sins. So that also seems to answer what he would interpret this means is that it's a pre-tribulation rapture. And that's a whole other sub question. So people will get caught up. Is it pre-trib? Is it post-trib? It's not. There's no rapture of Christians. And we are in the tribulation. You'll see in the book of Revelation. And we, but we're being protected from God's wrath 
but we're not protected from the wrath and persecution of the evil. So we'll see there's this mixed bag that we get to go through. Now, to repeat, Ephraim, this is basically a note on Ephraim. In contrast to Paul, Revelation's end-time teaching did not permit any opportunity for a rapture of Christians before or after Jesus' second coming. Paul is a sole, sole source of the idea that Christians are raptured when Jesus Christ returns. So you will not find this uh, this Paul view inside of the book of Revelations unless you squeeze and squish and you're willing to actually distort and contradict the text. I'm just going to read the red thing here. Paul's idea of a rapture of Christians that leaves evildoers behind, so we're up in heaven, they're down here, cannot fit into any scenario. Jesus himself gives in four to five different passages, we'll see, or in which Revelation relates to. Every solution to Paul's contradiction with Revelation has its rebuttal. These mutually repugnant theories are the direct result of trying to fit a square peg pole into a round hole of inspired canon. Okay, so we're going to now look at what Jesus says directly on the issue of who gets raptured. Jesus several times, and in the book of Revelation, one says that when Jesus returns, the evil are raptured out of the earth first, leaving behind the Christians. First, in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 42, Jesus taught when he comes, it will be like in the days of Noah when the flood came and took away the evildoers. That's who they were taken away by the flood. The, the uh, people on the boat were not taken away. <laughs> they were all taken away, the evil. It is in that context, Jesus says, one will be taken and another left. The verb taken regarding the person at the mill is the same word as in the flood that took them all away, meaning the evil. Just as the flood took all the evildoers away first, so will the evildoers be plucked out of the earth first and taken away at the second coming, is what Jesus is saying. And we'll see that's more explicit when we get to the text. Thus, Matthew 24, verses 37 to 42, intends the reader to understand by a parallelism that the true Christian is left behind, the evildoers are the ones taken. What helps confirm this reading is the Hebrew Matthew. Now, this is the oldest version of Matthew upon which the modern Greek translation was built. It has a variant that confirms Matthew 24, verse 40, is talking of the rapture of evildoers, not Christians. So I'll show you the book of Hebrew Matthew in a minute, and I'll make a more comment on what that book represents. We read in Matthew 24 the following additional language in red. Then, if there shall be two plowing in a field, one righteous and the other evil, the one will be taken and the other left. <clears throat> so notice in the passage, we already know there's one evil and one good. So we can't assume necessarily it's only the good that are being taken away. Just reading that. Two women will be grinding at a mill. One will be taken and the other left. So again, we can't just assume necessarily that only the good are being taken away. And now that possibility is erased when you get to the, the variant reading. So this, and we'll talk about why this variant is valid. This is because the angels at the end of the world will remove the stumbling blocks from the world and will separate the good from the evil. So the evil are the ones taken, not the good. And this is consistent with how Jesus had just talked about. Um, he says it's like when the people were taken away in the flood. The people taken away in the flood were the evil. Like here again, it's the evil who are taken away. Okay. Now let's let's look at the Howard book for a second, and I'll comment on the validity of that. So here is a book by Professor George Howard, Professor of Religion, Mercer University Press, 1995, called The Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. I'll tell you what that is in a second. And you'll see the passage I was just quoting to you is from page 123. And if you see the bottom two lines there, this is because the angels at the end of the world will remove the stumbling blocks. That's the evil. So who is being raptured? The evil. Raptured means taken away. So it doesn't have a good connotation. It has, you don't want to be raptured. By, the, by, by every force in your body, you don't want to be raptured because Jesus is saying it's only if you're a stumbling block, you'll be taken away. So the, the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew represents a tr manuscript that the Jews kept for basically a very long time. That was the, uh, the, what the early Christians were using. It was a Hebrew version of Matthew. It went through transformations. Uh, Jerome translated it. it. You know, then this particular one was also amended from time to time to include what they found as they move forward. And so it has some reflection of the Vulgate Matthew, but there is an underlying text that relates all the way back to the first century, and that's what Professor Howard you know, details in his book. And you can see there's certain language and uh, other things that explain the the uh, Greek text better when you see it in the Hebrew, and then he translates it back into Hebrew. So anyway, 
it's a valid, uh, it's truly a fifth gospel. Jerome treated it as a fifth gospel. He made 22 commentaries on the Hebrew Matthew. He spoke very highly of it. He said most people believe this is the original text. Now, this text is, is from the fifth, uh, 1300, so it's this is not the exact original text that Jerome was looking at in the 400s, of course. So we just have to realize that there's always a possibility this got changed in ways that can't be correct, but this makes sense and it fits the context. So a verse got dropped somewhere in the Christian transmission of the book of Matthew. That's all this represents. Okay, so next we're going to see Jesus using the same terminology about the wheat and the tares. So there, there we were just listening to Jesus telling us not a simple prophetic statement about uh, the one sowing, or the one in the field will be taken, and then one won't be taken. Okay, now we now we're in a parable, the parable of wheat and the tares. The wheat are the good, the tares are the bad. Okay, that's obvious. Tares are uh, bad. Look, wheat, bad wheat, or a bad form of a weed that looks like wheat, but it's really just a tear. And, and Jesus is going to say that tear is taken first. So let's listen to him. This is verses 30, and then it, it's a long story, so it drops to 40 and gives us the the, uh, the conclusion we want to see. Verse 30, let both grow together, the wheat and the tares, until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the, the good wheat. Oh, no, no, it says tares, the bad wheat fake looking wheat and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn now the barn isn't up in heaven doesn't say that don't read into it the barn actually sounds like a building on earth so it's not you can't draw any more conclusions and it's taking first the wheat away and the reapers to do this and then jesus in verse 40 says and therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire so shall it be in the end of this world so there you go that's the they're they're taken away first and they're burned and the what what happens to the wheat they're put in a barn sounds like it's still here on earth so the the parable of the wheat and tares provides strong confirmation that what jesus is talking about is the taking away of evildoers first so uh, gather up first the tares, the evildoers, to burn them. So that's simply a rapture. And it tells you the, the instant thing that's going to happen is they're going to be suffering, whatever that burning is. And uh, that you'll see in Revelation 14 when Jesus says, I'm going to take the sickle down, I'm going to reap, reap uh, the, the, um, the evildoers, they're going to be pressed into a wine press, you know, basically destroyed or uh, punished or whatever. So it's clearly a rapture of the evil. Now, right after that parable of the wind tears, he's actually going to do emphatic prophecies. So th these are no longer parables. And he's going to say the same thing. He's going to actually explain what I just said, what was parabolic. Make, you could all figure it out without him explaining it, but now he's going to explain exactly what I just told you. Verse 41, the Son of Man, this is Matthew 13, the, the Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom, so his kingdom is where? On earth, all stumbling blocks and those who what? Commit lawlessness or anomia, which is also means attacking the law, a nomos, a is anti, nomos means the law of Moses, so it's lawlessness or they're anti-Mosaic law people and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Where's that kingdom? Sounds like it's still down here because they got the bad guys got raptured out. We're still here. He who has ears, let him hear. So will it be in the at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. It sounds exactly what he said just previously in the prior chapter about the two people in the field. One will be taken and the other will, will be left. He's saying the people left are the good people. The people taken away are the bad people. And they will throw them into the ferns of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we see he's made this statement how many times? Four times in just the chapter 13. In the story about the story parable of the people in the field. Then in the parable... Um, and then he explains that uh, statement about them in the field. Then he gives a parable of the wheat and the tares, and then he explains that statement. That's four times he makes it very clear. It's the evil who are taken out, not the good. And the, the good are left behind, or they're in a barn. They're okay. Okay, so here comes the explicit rapture. Revelation 14 to 14 to 20. 
And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in the sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. You don't want to be in that group. I'm just going to pause here. We're going to read Gundry in a minute. Gundry's going to claim this was Christians. So don't laugh when I tell you he says this. He says, oh, no, this is Christians. We're, and he says, Paul talks about there being a grain harvest. So we're in a grain harvest. And, we're, you know, it's not a bad thing to be in this sickle rapture here because that's, okay, that's how crazy Paul will make people, <laughs> that they will actually blind themselves to what they can see on the page. Okay, so this is ridiculous, right? But we'll, we'll, we'll let him hear. I always try to give the other guy a hearing, so I'll, I'll refer to what he says, and you can weigh whether it makes any sense, but I want to prepare you. This is what he's going to claim. In verse 20, and the wine press was trodden without the city. So the interesting thing is the holy city is, there's like a new Jerusalem, uh, and I, this could be uh, what he's talking about, I assume. So this wine press is without the city, without side of our bounds. And the blood came out of the wine press, even up to the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Again, this cannot be Christians being crushed like this for what? For what purpose? I mean, for the saved group. I, I don't think God would crush us, destroy us, and then tell us, this is you, like Mr. Gundry is trying to tell us. Just don't see it. All right, so we've clearly seen in Matthew 13, verses 30 to 41, four times Jesus says the rapture is first of evil lures. We've seen the same thing in Revelation 14, 1 to 4, and 14 to 20, twice. That's six times. <laughs> okay, so it's hard to imagine how people can't see this. Christians are left behind in place where Christ is coming so as to greet them on earth. By the way, there's, several, there's similar prophecy in the book of Zechariah, chapter 3, verse 11. This is in the JPS, which is a Jewish publication society, and the American Standard Version. In that day, and I bracketed here, this is a synopsis, when God sets up the kingdom of God on earth, close bracket, I will take away out of the midst of thee thy proudly exulting ones. Thou shalt no more be haughty, thou, you shall no more be haughty in my holy mountain, 312, but I will leave in the midst of thee in a and afflicted and poor, the Ebion people, and they shall take refuge in the name of Yahweh. So, Zechariah prophesied what? God will take away, out of the midst of the people, all the proudly exulting ones, so the proud ones, the sinners, there shall be no more haughty people on my holy mountain. And then, verse uh, Zechariah 3.12, but I will leave in the midst the afflicted and the poor. No wonder the early church called themselves the Ebion, because this is how they viewed themselves eschatologically, meaning in an end time way of thinking. They wanted to be this poor. That was the that was their goal. So eschatologically, they did not think they were going up. They were staying down because this is where the kingdom is. We don't want to go up, which is death and destruction, and then that's not what we want, right? Okay. So now that you've seen the big picture, Jesus four times, Jesus in, in the Gospels, two times in the book of Revelation, and prophesied in the book of Zechariah. Now look at Paul. Can you actually look at him now more objectively and say he's wrong? Can you say this in your heart as you listen to this? Listen to this man has it completely backwards. For the Lord, 1 Timothy 4, verse 16 to 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You. So when we started this, you admitted to yourself, I'm sure, that Christians are raptured from the earth. Now what would you say? It's a violative of everything Jesus says, everything the book of Revelation says, and everything God ever said in the original Bible. So who's telling the truth? All those references from God, Yahweh, and Jesus, or Paul? You have your own answer. It's in your own mind. I don't have to tell you what it is. But I always like to make sure you get to hear the other side. Who, what, what, you know, what are they saying? How do they explain this? Well, first of all, they don't face all these verses, but... The, the main theory people have is this. The Christian rapture proponents believe the rapture is implied somewhere in Revelation chapter 12. 
and thus precedes the second coming of Jesus at Revelation 14.1. So they do not see them at the, at the same time event, same, same time horizon at all. So Revelation 14 and whatever the rapture that was, is like not even not the rapture we're waiting for. We're waiting for the one in 12. And they're claiming that's where the, the woman who flees to the mountain is us, is the church. So why do they claim Revelation 12 has this message of a, of a rapture of us, distinct from the rapture in, in chapter 14? Revelation 12, 1 involves a woman who later said to have given birth to Jesus. Revelation 12, verse 5. Incongruously, meaning it makes no sense, rapture proponents equate this woman who gave birth to Jesus with the church of Jesus Christ. The reason they do so will be explained momentarily, but equating her to the church is grasping at straws to sustain the rapture of Christian view, Christian's view inherited from Paul. It is because, why? Because it's Jesus who gave birth to the church and not vice versa. The church didn't give birth to Jesus. This woman cannot be the church giving birth to Jesus. That is offensive. Now, the, the reason this is even appealing to, to the Paulinists who can't get rid of Paul and they want to ignore all those references I gave you from the Zechariah, from the book of Revelation, four passages of Jesus, you know, the overwhelming evidence that they're wrong. They don't want to listen. What is appealing about this woman representing the church to the Paulinists or Paul Rapturists is this woman takes flight to the mountains. So she's escaping. What's the problem with that? The rapture proponents are equating a flight to the mountains with a rapture into heaven. Paul spoke about heaven, not um, not going up to some mountain. Okay, so she's on earth. She doesn't get raptured into heaven. That's that's the problem. Now, revelation is often figurative. I have to agree, right? That's true. It may mean other things, but just way too far stretched to say a flight to the mountains is a flight into heaven. Then who is this woman, really? She represents the sons of Israel, likely. Why? That is how she gives birth to Jesus. Jesus comes from the, what? One of the 12 tribes, the tribe of Judah. But it cannot be the church, per se, because the church did not give birth to Jesus. The woman must pre-exist Christ's birth, and then that's what we see. And yet she's displayed here as a victor with Christ. I just want to show you something that that they also ignore is there's all discussion kind of discussions that Christians are being persecuted in this period of time right until the rapture of the evil ones, okay? And I think that gives you a better context to understand that we're still here. Christians didn't go anywhere. And what happens is we're going to be protected while this is happening. And that's going to be mentioned. We get protected from God's wrath on the evil people in the period prior to the to the rapture of evil. And so that's the only protection we get. But we don't get protected from being persecuted and killed. So that's why we have to be prepared to endure. And Jesus told us to be prepared to endure. So let's delve deeper. Okay, when Christ returns and sets forth on Mount Zion, Revelation 14, 4, 4, that's when that happens, he is welcomed by the 144,000 saints, right? The rapture of the evil ones occurs right at that point. However, previously, the 144,000 were sealed and thus protected from God's outpouring of wrath while they lived on earth. You'll find that in Revelation 7, verses 3 to 4. So they've been mentioned seven chapters earlier. And that's what we are. So we know for seven chapters, they're being protected from God's wrath when he's punishing all the evil. After that period of wrath, but prior to Jesus' return at Revelation 14, 4, what's happening to us? The beast comes, the bad guy that we're all worried about that he could tempt us into taking a mark and all of that stuff. He comes to persecute and martyr Christians. This killing of the saints continues all the way from chapter 7 of the book of Revelation through chapter 14 and the rapture of the evil. And that's the tribulation period. They were persecuted by the beast and many of Christians were killed. Between uh, That's mentioned in Revelation 11.7. It's also prophesied in the book of Daniel 7.25 that the saints will go through this period. So numerous times in Revelation, Jesus urges the churches to be prepared for this tribulation period and to be overcomers. So it was not something we ever could expect to be removed, be protected from by being raptured before the evil is raptured out of the earth. So we're looking and waiting for something that will never happen. We're not being raptured out. We have to hunker down and endure. And the important reason that we need to get this psychologically in our heads is if we're suffering during the rapture and we have to take a beating or whatever to stick by Jesus Christ, we don't take it as a sign that you've been, you know, left behind or you're lost or whatever. That's not what Jesus promised you. He promised you 
only that if God was bringing his wrath, you won't be affected. But if the evil go after you, you will be tested and you might be tried. And, you know, so that that's uh, that's an important encouragement lesson we need to be enduring. OK, so now let's look more concretely at how the book of Revelation is ending. You have the second coming beginning at Revelation 14.1. Jesus is standing on the mountain of Zion with the Christian saints who endured the beast. Then Revelation chapter 14 describes how Jesus is seen in the clouds with his great sickle to harvest the earth. And the evildoers are removed from the earth by two sweeps of the great sickle. The remnant of the faithful saints, the 144,000, are left behind to inherit the earth for their testimony of Jesus, Revelation 20, verse 4. Then the New Jerusalem comes down to earth on Revolution, Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5. And then the song the faithful sing is, thanks to God, we shall reign on the earth, Revelation 5, 9 to 10. So there is there is the full story. And, and the, you, you, the rapture was only in one place. It was in Revelation 14, and it was of the evil, not of the Christian. Okay, and um, this is Mr. Gundry's solution. Uh, he's a professor at Westmont College, and he's struggling to explain away the raptures of the evildoers in Revelation chapter 14. And instead of it being evildoers, he's going to equate it instead with the rapture of Christians. He does this by first abstractly identifying this event as a grain harvest. doesn't really explain why. He says, Jesus, quote, reaps a harvest of grain in Revelation 14, 14-20. I disagree. It was revel if anything, it was grapes, um, because it has when it's pressed out in the wine press of wrath of God, it's called blood as well. Um, now he writes this in Bob Gundry, first the Antichrist, bigger books, Grand Rapids, 1997 at 98 and 99. Gundry then compares this to Paul's vision of Jesus taking us in a grain harvest, First Corinthians 15, 20, verse 23 verses 35 to 49. So now he's comparing a completely uh, radically separated passage that is a uh, different book completely from where he, where Paul was mentioning the rapture. So that's a kind of a leap. Gundry then says the gr this grain harvest is presented as a blessing, citing Revelation 14, 13. Now why does he do that? Well, it doesn't fit the context of the, of the reaping, does it? Uh, Revelation 14, 13 says this. However, this verse does not say those caught away by Jesus' sickle are blessed. He says, quote, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. We are not to understand that this winepress of the wrath of God is a blessing to these people. So it's clear in Revelation 14, 18 that grapes are caught away from the earth, not grain in this harvest, and they have to be put in the winepress of the wrath of God outside the city. So this is a place of shame and destruction. Revelation 14, verses 19 to 20. When pressed out, the juice that flows is identified as blood, Revelation 14, 20, which would sort of signify that God is punishing them or destroying them somehow outside the city. Therefore, it's not a blessing from inside the kingdom. So Gundry is clearly wrong. But you can see how ridiculous people will get is when they won't listen to Jesus and they are compelled to make Paul fit inside of what is the true rapture. It's a rapture of evildoers and somehow have Paul being uh, just being ex not justified but actually this is what Paul meant is is we would be uh, in this uh, wine press of God's fury but of course uh, Mr. Gundry overlooked or forgot or didn't pay attention to the fact it's a negative prophecy and very harmful to, to say Christians are going to go through the wine press of the wrath of God okay so that just goes to show you how pressed against the wall the <laughs> fun that's funny pressed against the wall are those who try to uh uh, reconcile Paul's view with scripture. It doesn't work. You have to end up with this kind of an absurd, absurd conclusion. And let me just say this is to the idea that there's a pre-trib rapture. So that, that one really doesn't work because Jesus tells us that after the tribulation, he will come on the clouds of glory and we will see this. So he's he says that in Matthew 24 verses 29 to 34. So that means the tribulation is over and we're going to see his coming. So we're here when this happens. So Jesus' portrayal is that Christians will be looking up from earth and see him coming on the clouds. If there are no Christians continuously on earth before and during the tribulation, then Jesus' words have no significance as warnings as clearly he intended. So he was telling us, you know, look up, be waiting, be prepared, and you'll see me on the clouds of glory. So we have to go through the tribulation. So there's no such thing as a pre-trib rapture. 
Okay, and the final thing I just want to leave us all with is the uh, kind of as a recap is we've seen that Paul has a doctrine that is completely falsified by Jesus Christ. So that's just another reminder who we're supposed to be listening to. And then we need to keep this in mind, Revelation 14, 12. Uh, this is a reminder of how we need to prepare ourselves for that time. If the uh, time of tribulation comes while we're still alive, it says, This calls for endurance on the part of the saints, those who keep the commandments and hold fast to their faith or in faithfulness towards Jesus. And then it says in verse 13, Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. So uh, that's uh, that, that'll conclude this episode, and I hope that this was helpful and edifying to all. Okay, take care. Ciao. By the way, uh, thank you for visiting, and you can sign up for a newsletter via a link in the video description section of YouTube on this video.